let's do what I said we would do today. So let me just remind you that we are exploring a quantum spin chain. And, uh, and as we said in the beginning of the course, very much we are exploring in this lecture some interplay between classics, semi-classics, quantum, and so on. And we start very quantum. We start, we have a spin chain, a quantum spin chain. There are some excitations on this spin chain that we call magnets. And we found some set of quantum equations that describe the exact quantum spectrum for any number of excitations, any length of the spin chain, any anything. It is just exact. And those are these bit, this nice bit equations that we wrote, this algebraic polynomial, if you want, if you put everything to the same denominator equations, which a priori, if we were infinitely powerful, we would just solve them and be happy. OK? So that's the quantum story. Then. We said that there should be some nice semi-classical description valid for very long wavelengths when these u's are very large, which means very long, very low momenta and very low energy as well, where these roots, the solutions to these equations, they distribute themselves in some umbrella-like shapes with more and more particles. And we saw that they can be organized by how many of such groups you have. Do you have one group, two groups, three groups, four groups, and so on. And then we saw that there is further a classical limit where these roots condense into cuts. Of course, when I say that root positions condense into cuts, I have to introduce some function that has poles at those points and such that in the continuum limit, that function instead of poles develops cuts. We did it. We call that function quasi-momenta. And more, more precisely, the right function to say that it lives on a two-sheet of Riemann surface is not the quasi-momenta. The quasi-momenta we saw lives in a, in a beast of an infinitely dimensional sheet of dimension, so it's a very complicated object. But the nice objects that live on a two-sheeted surface are either the derivative of p or e to the ip and e to the minus ip, because as you cross a cut, p picks an integer, but that integer is killed if you either exponentiate or take, or take a derivative. And then we have a disconnected world, where we start again from quantum, and by taking a low energy, we take some low energy approximation. We do some low energy approximation, start introducing some coherent states. We derive some effective description based on some coherent space, based on some auxiliary field N that was varying slowly along the spin chain, such that we could replace that by a continuum. And in particular, in the classical limit, this vector N obeys some spin equations that describe a spin, a vector moving on a sphere and precessing. Those are called, those, this, the, the model we got is called the Landau-Lipschitz model. So those are the equations of motion for the Landau-Lipschitz model. So the expectation is that each algebraic curve here should correspond to one solution to the equations of motion here. And that, if, if we can find it, then we will have a desired understanding. We would close this loop of ideas and we would understand where are these algebraic curves coming from if I, if I started directly from the right. OK? So any question here? Yes? Yeah, we, the, the main approximation was that we said that each vector n was changing slowly along the chain. So it's kind of a derivative expansion. We could imagine that, so it was, it was reasonable to say that ni minus ni plus 1 is just derivative of ni. So that's clearly an approximation. If the spins, for example, imagine you are studying, you would like to derive an effective theory around the antiferromagnetic state. It would be very wrong to say that the spin ni and the ni plus 1 are almost the same. Instead, for example, um, <clears throat> OK, so before I do that. Let me also point out that what we did actually was kind of nice because I did not point out, but there were two nice things. One, we could do it for any spin. If I do it for general spin, S appears here as a parameter, as an extra parameter. But the second thing, I could do it in any dimension. Do it in one dimension was not crucial. If I would have done it in general dimensions, the only thing that would change is that the second derivative would become a Laplacian, a spatial Laplacian, right? Because the Hamiltonian is si dot si plus dot, s, dot sj, where si and sj are neighbors. And we just get the derivative in that direction instead of the derivative in the sigma direction in our derivation. Nothing would change otherwise. So it's very general. So it's, it's cool because this kind of effective description with the Laplacian here, instead of just derivative, would work in any general space, uh, in any general number of dimensions. 
And in particular, if you are in higher dimensions, the antiferromagnetic, the, uh, the antiferromagnetic state is kind of easy to describe. It's the nil state where spins alternate, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. It's nice that we have this dimension as a parameter, because actually in one dimension, the antiferromagnetic state is much more complicated. It's not up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. It's a complicated beast, which is a singlet, a combination of many, many states. It, it's a very hard state to describe. But let's close our eyes, and given that this is valid in any dimension, let's try to approach this antiferromagnetic state by starting in, not in the equal one, but in general D. And then I would make an approximation where I would write that my n, instead of being a field that changes slowly, it's minus 1 to the j times a field that changes slowly. Right? Because then it would alternate automatically. And then I would run the same derivation and so on. And you would find a different field theory. And it, it turns out that then it works well even to describe excitations at one dimension, but uh, it's less well justified because the starting point with this alternating pattern is a bit oversimplified. But morally speaking, we knew it should be more or less OK, and indeed it is. OK, good. More questions, yeah? You were saying for every um, solution there corresponds to an algebraic curve. What are the objects that are the algebraic curve? Oh, that's what we are going to understand today. That's the topic of today's lecture, is to understand exactly what are these algebraic curves on the picture on the right. OK, good. So now you could ask, when are these equations of motion a reasonable description? And it actually turns out that they, are, um, they will give a reasonable description of all these, all these states, even if the spin is 1 half, as we will see. I will show you, then we can discuss why it was this valid. OK? But the fact of life is the following, is that from these treatments, right, what, we, what did we achieve on the, uh, here? Here we said that the energy was 1 over L, OK? We said that it goes like 1 over L, times a function that depends on the various quantum numbers, namely Ni over L, the various filling fractions of each cut, and the various mole numbers at each cut. And we said that this function, finding this function is equivalent to fixing all the moduli of algebraic curves and we saw that for each set choice of filling fractions and Ni, we could find an algebraic curve. And we will see that here we will get exactly information, the same information about this function, the same algebraic curves, which will be isomorphic. So it will show that this approximation is valid for, this low, for all this low energy dynamics. OK? And then I can discuss at the end why it is, why it is true. It will be the exact system of the, of the full system at large spin. That's true. Because at large spin, uh, if the spin is very large, and if you have one spin which is very large at each side, the spin is effectively classical because it's very large. So, uh, so the equations of motion will describe the spin chain will not be a quantum spin chain if the spin is very large. You are totally right. Then there will be no approximation whatsoever. Here there are some approximations, and we are not expected to match this model with a full quantum model, rather with only this picture here. And indeed, this less ambitious thing is what we are going to do, which is already very good. Yes, Tom? Um, we can calculate a dispersion for the low energy excitation from the system. Yeah, we could. And we would find the same thing that we would find here. If you take an excitation and take very low momenta, you find that it just goes uh, as p square, and uh, you would find the same p square here. If I were to do this. Because it's sine square of p. So sine square of p, if you expand at low momenta, is, is p square. No, but then you want for antiferromagnets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, you so would get Goldstone modes, of course. Right? Of course, yeah, you, you must. Very good. OK. So any question here? OK, any question? No? So let, let me just make a provocative comment. Well, it's not provocative, it's a, a serious comment. Which is that this vector n, this picture here, looks like a string. And I can think of it as describing some sort of string theory. That is a string that is moving on a sphere. It's not moving in 10-dimensional flat space. It's moving on the sphere, and it's moving around. 
this loop is moving, and it's moving according to these equations of motion, and this is the quantum action. Okay? So it already looks like some kind of effective description of my spin chain in terms of a model that I can call a string-like model, if you want. It's just notation, no one can disagree with me, but it describes a loop n of sigma that closes, so for each time there is an n of sigma, and then this loop evolves with time, and uh, it is just a feature that the target space is a sphere, and the world sheet is two-dimensional because we have time and space, so it looks like a string theory, which is intuitive. It is just a statement that a big spin chain, if things are varying smoothly, it's, not, it's no longer looking at like a discrete object, but rather like a smooth object. And the string is a smooth loop. What happens to this string that is here? This, that, that was periodic in beta, wasn't it? That was periodic in beta, yeah. So what happens when beta is zero times this is like zero, then it's infinitely like exactly the same as zero? <clears throat> you mean infinite temperature? Like, uh, yeah, infinite temperature. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I would rather not think about the infinite temperature, given that we are doing a low-energy approximation. But, uh, I think it's probably not very reasonable. OK, now let's go on and try to analyze. And we said that once we solve these equations of motion, we can read off the energy of the solution. So uh, did everyone do the tutorial? So in the tutorial, you took one solution of these equations of motion, plugged it into the energy, and got exactly the one-cut solution. So it's not a total mystery already. We already saw that at least for one solution, there is a map between solutions that look like one cut and one cut. OK? Now, good. So now, let's start with a simple claim that we will then prove. And the claim is the following. Is the claim is, there are two parts of the claim. The claim number one, now, actually, it's only one part. The claim is the following. Let's construct a 2 by 2 matrix valued connection. OK? So this matrix valued connection, it's just like in a non-abelian gauge theories, when you define a gauge field. OK? So you have A, which is a connection. So it's a form. It has a component along sigma and a component along tau. And each of these A sigma and A tau are two by two matrices. OK? What are these matrices? Let me tell you. This is definition. So the claim will be something about this subject. Where A sigma is equal to some constant, we will fix these constants. But I want to put it to, to make some points. These constants will be all one or almost one, but we will fix them. I sigma dot our vector n over u. u will be what we call the spectral parameter. For now, it's a new parameter that belongs to C. There's some new complex number. And A tau will be given by another constant times the same thing. With a u square instead of u. Plus A3 times another vector over u. OK? In fact, as you will see, you can forget about the spectral parameter. And you can ignore, because I'm putting an arbitrary constant a1, a2, a3, I can always absorb u in these arbitrary constants. So for now, you can ignore the spectral parameter. I just put it there. Uh, yeah, it's kind of an historical accident that I knew the flat connection was like this. I did not remember the constant, so I put them there, and now we will fix them. But uh, anyway, uh, we, you will see. So these are a1, a2, a3 are constants that we will fix soon. This is a definition. This n is a vector. So this is the same n 
this is the same as on the other blackboard. So this is our n of sigma and tau. And these are Pauli matrices. So that's why it's, it's two, by, 2 by 2 matrix, right? It's sigma x and x plus sigma y and y plus sigma z and z. OK, so this is the definition. And what is the claim? The claim is that A is flat. Or more precisely, the claim is that A is flat if and only if N obeys uh, the equations of motion. OK? So this is the claim. OK, good. Now let me remind you what a flat connection is. A flat connection is a connection for which, if we think of this in a, as a non-abelian gauge field, if we construct the, the associated field strength, the associated F mu nu, we get zero. So let's construct our field strength. The field strength is just derivative. Let me write very explicitly. Derivative with respect to tau of a sigma minus derivative with respect to sigma of a tau minus or plus, I don't, I never, I always forget, plus the commutator of a sigma and a tau equal to zero. So this would be what we would call our field strength, f tau sigma, and we are setting it to zero. So the claim is that this condition is the same as the equations of motion for n. But as you will see, having a connection that is flat is something very powerful. So we do want to trade equations of motion to the, by the flatness condition of this. And what is crucial, actually, I should emphasize here, is that A is flat for any u. And the power of all this comes from this statement, that it's flat for any u, because there is a new parameter u, which was an ad hoc parameter. And the claim is that being flat, not just at a particular u, but for any u, is what makes it equivalent to the equations of motion. OK. So, so any question here about uh, words or about definitions or? This A is traceless, yeah. Because it's Pauli matrices. Yeah, it's an it's a matrix that belongs to the SU2 algebra. Right? So I'm writing so this A, I can say that A this it's two by two. A is an element of the SU2 algebra. So let me use small letters. And as such, it is traceless. And that's actually important. That will come up in a minute. When a matrix is traceless, exponential of that matrix gives a matrix that has unit determinant. If a matrix is traceless, if an algebra element is traceless, the group element has unit determinant. Right? So this small s for the algebra, for the group, which is big S, SU2 with capital letters translates into having elements with unit determinant, and that will come about soon. So, so OK, this is a claim, and we are going to check this claim. So, so let's just check it. It's, it's, it's not very complicated. So let's compute the three terms. So I'll put some parentheses. When the first term finishes, I close the parentheses. Then I put another parenthesis for the second term, and so on. So let's do it. So the first term is derivative with respect to tau of a sigma. Let me first check that I did not swap a sigma and a tau. That would be bad. It's OK. So, so let's do it. So we have i, a1, which is a constant, and then sigma dot derivative with respect to time of n divided by u. And actually, the first term finished. It was fast. OK, minus. Now let's do the second term, derivative with respect to sigma of the second term. So we have a2 i sigma dot derivative with respect to sigma of n divided by u square. That's one of them. Plus a3 <coughs> times, and now there are two terms. The derivative with respect to sigma can eat this guy or this guy. 
Of course, if it hits the second one, I get zero because I get dn wedge dn. So I only care about the derivative acting the first, on the first term. So the second term gives I sigma dotted with second derivative of n wedge n divided by u. Good. And now what about the commutator? Plus commutator of a sigma, which gives I a 1 sigma dot n over u with a tau, but from a tau I, I only keep the second term because the first term is the same operator as, as here. Up, it's proportional to this, so of course it commutes with it. So I only keep the second term, so I have I a 3 sigma wedge n, no, wedge d sigma n wedge n over u. Okay? So here it is. And now let's see what's going on, and let's see why this is uh, let's see how it works. So let me see how it works. So, okay, so there is just a f some simple massaging to be done here. So here, you see, that you are commuting this. So what you know is that commutator of sigma i with sigma j gives i epsilon i j k sigma k, right? So when I plug this here, what happens? I have sigma commutator with sigma. I use that. So i with i gives minus 1, and I get 1i from there. So this term will simplify to minus i, right? i, i, i. And then this epsilon, i, j, k, that we get from here, one index is free, is the one that contracts with the sigma k, so we get sigma dotted. So this dot now in the, it's respect to this index k, but the indices i and j contract with the rest. So the rest, with an epsilon tensor, it is just a definition of cross product. So we get n wedge d sigma n wedge n. And all this is multiplied by the constant a1, a3 over u square. Here? You see, this is the reason why I put this a's. <laughs> it's because uh, I always forget these factors. So I knew that I would have to fix them in the lecture, so it's better to start immediately with them. Good. Yeah. Precisely. So, <clears throat> and now, this thing here, right, just this n wedge where then, uh, we used it already last lecture, remember? We used an identity like this to simplify this. This is just the same thing as n wedge n times del sigma n plus a term that is zero for the same reason, perhaps minus n dot del sigma n um, times the vector n. And this is zero because n squared is one, so derivative of n squared is zero, so this term here is zero. So we can replace this by this. This is one. So all in all, this commutator, let's summarize, this commutator gives minus 2i a1 a3 over u square times sigma wedge d sigma of n. Okay? That's the summary. <coughs> Good. So it has the potential of cancelling this term. So commutator will cancel this. For that to happen, we need something like a2 to be equal to minus 2a1a3. 
So that tells me that this is a condition on this phase that I want to impose. Right? Then they cancel. They will cancel. And let's put here for any u, just if I choose constants like this. So I can choose a1 equal 1, a3 equal 1, and a2 equal to minus 2. OK? So what about the remaining terms, this one and this one? Well, this one and this one, I just use equations of motion, because the equations of motion tell me that the derivative of n is precisely n wedge second derivative. So this, the last two, so this <coughs> cancels due to the equations of motion. And then it fixes that a1 um, or a3, let's say, a3 over a1, which is that parameter over this parameter, should be this lambda over 2 L square, right, which is what appears there. OK? Now, what I want to point out is that, let me just point out some, some simple comment. I could have started without u here, just with a1, a2, and a3. Right? Because that is valid for any u. So let's set u equal to 1 first and repeat this analogy. So I put u equal to 1, and I find those equations, the same equations. But then I have two equations for three variables. Right? So the general solution has one free parameter. So that free parameter is the spectral parameter. OK? So if I had not introduced it in the beginning, I had started with, uh, without u, I put u equal to 1. I would see it emerging as a one-parameter family of solutions to these two equations for three parameters. Right? So these two equations, they fix the ratio of a1, a3. They fix the product of a1, a3. But they leave a2 unfixed. I can put a2 whatever I want. I can think of a2 as a continuous variable. In terms of that continuous variable, I find the product. And then the ratio is fixed. So no one can fix a2 for me. So a2, I can put whatever I want. In particular, I can define a2 to be 1 over a parameter u squared, which is a new parameter. And this is how I would introduce the spectral parameter if I did not know about it. And that's, in practice, how people find these flat connections. They write, some, they write the most general thing they could write. This is not the most general. I could add a few more terms. But they write this, the most general, but enough. And that you could write. And then they fix all these constants such that the connection is flat. And then they find, is there a one-parameter family of flat connections? Or is it totally fixed? Or is there a two-parameter family of flat connections? And so on and so forth. OK? So the comment I want to make here is that we could have derived, or we could have, and we probably should have, introduced u here. So it would probably be the right place to start with u. Probably the best would have been to put u equal to 1, and now see that there is a one-parameter family. This is where u would first appear. OK, good. So the claim is true. Being flat for any u implies that n obeys the equations of motion. OK? But you see why it is crucial that it is for any u now. Because what we are doing is we are canceling the terms with 1 over u, and we are canceling the terms with 1 over u squared. If it was true just for a particular u, it would give me a weaker constraint. Right? It's canceling the terms. To, we get two equations out of one equation because we impose it to be true for any u. So we get that the coefficient of, uh, of 1 over u squared has to cancel. And why does it work? Because n is a unit vector. It was crucial. We just used that n was a unit vector. We did not use the equations of motion. But we did use that n is a unit vector. And then it has to vanish for the terms proportional to 1 over u. And that gave me bt equations, uh, the landau lipschitz equations of motion. Right? So it is true. So this statement is true. Now, let me, let me tell you why this is a relevant statement, why this is important, and why, why from here the jump to this algebraic curve is actually quite
quite a straightforward. It's naturally not that complicated. So what can we do with connections? What do we do with connections? When we have a gauge theory, what do we do with a connection? That's a question. So I give you a, what do we do with connections? Sorry? Take covariant derivatives. So indeed, a connection is something that allows me to take a covariant derivative, which is to say that it allows me to know how to move in space in a proper way, in a gauge invariant way. Right? So you know that, for example, so let, this is a parenthesis about gauge theories now. So we know that in a gauge theory, for example, we could have, we could imagine some quark that transforms under gauge transformation to omega of x times quark and some quark bar that will transform into Q bar of x times omega inverse of x under a gauge transformation. For example, this would be something natural. Then, uh, suppose you want to construct a quark at some position x, or a quark at some position y, and some quark bar at some position x, like a quark-antiquark -quark pair in a gauge invariant way. Right? So what can you do? What is the natural object to do? Well, in a, in a non-gauge theory, when I have just a parent, when I have phi of x times phi of y, I can define this. It's a non-local object, but I have the right to define it. It's whatever it is. And this object, this is the same as saying that I have phi of x e to the y minus x dx times phi of x. I put some non-local operator that translates by an amount y minus x, and I start at x, and from x go to y. And the analog statement that I should do here is that the proper way of translating things would be, for example, one option, using a covariant derivative that would not translate me in a gauge invariant way. And this object is such that this object here, which if I go, which I can now, I can further transport it along different paths. This is going along a straight line. Okay? And this, I would call this object the Wilson line that goes along a straight line. And it depends on the first point and on the final point. And their gauge transformations, this is why these covariant derivatives are introduced, it transforms as omega of x times the Wilson line times omega minus 1 of y such that you see that if this full object is gauge invariant because it eats up the transformation, the omegas, from the quark and the antiquark. This is how we normally introduce this connection, after all. This is the usual way of introducing it. Right? <laughs> so this W here, which we can also say that for a given, we can generalize it and say that for a, ran, for a general path, gamma, I can introduce the path ordered exponential around some curve gamma of my connection. You see, I don't need to put a dx or anything because the connection is a form. So this is the mathematician's way of writing. I feel like I'm doing some very fancy stuff when I write these things. For a mathematician, I look like a chemist. Very good. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> So, uh, so this, would correspond, uh, this would correspond to this. And what is this object? This is just defined by thinking that I break this into many small pieces. And I propagate piece by piece. So I start E to the epsilon A at my final position. And then E to the I epsilon A at my initial position. Okay, you can figure out that in the middle there is X minus epsilon, X minus 2 epsilon, blah, 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 blah. So this would be my definition of going along this, going along this path. This is one definition, definition number one. And there are many other equivalent definitions. There are actually three reasonable equivalent definitions. If you want, I can discuss them. If not, let me just uh, 
close the parentheses, and this is just a review of how we can think of a flat connection. What is a connection? Sorry, not flat. What is a connection? Connection is a way of constructing. <clears throat> it's a way of, um, of propagating and constructing gauge invariant objects that propagate between, uh, uh, between two points. And more generally, we can define them from their own sake. We can say, let's define this path order exponential. Then this object just alone, like the two fields alone were not gauge invariant, this object is not gauge invariant because it transforms back to itself times omega times omega at the two end points, right? Times omega minus one. But we could make it gauge invariant. We could make it gauge invariant by identifying the two points by making not a Wilson line, but a Wilson loop. This would be almost OK, except that we would still get an omega and an omega minus 1 at the end. But to cancel those, we just trace. Because if you trace the first and the last omega, they just cancel. So this object, defined as the trace, trace of the path order exponential around a closed loop gamma of A, is what people call a Wilson loop. <clears throat> okay? What about small variations of a Wilson loop? If I take my Wilson loop, what happens when I consider a small variation of my Wilson loop? A small deformation of the loop. And this is actually probably, the, I think, in my opinion, it's the nicest definition of what a field strength is. A field strength can be defined by, uh, by the variation of the propagation Give by a given trajectory. It's in the same way as we define the Riemann tensor in GR. We say that we have some curvature, we propagate something along some rectangle in one direction, in another rectangle, we measure the different effect, and this defines the Riemann tensor. Or that's the proper way, or the Ricci tensor, and so on. It's by some geometrical difference of going through one small path, another small path, and so on. Here, the same thing. If I have a piece of Wilson loop, and we consider a small variation here, this variation has some area element delta s mu nu. And the variation of the Wilson loop is given by putting the Wilson loop at this point inserting f mu nu times the variation of the area. Okay, at this point and then continuing the loop. So putting a small variation here corresponds is the same as inserting a field strength at that point. Okay? So imagine you go in a straight line. You can say I have path order exponential from here to the point where I put a variation, then I put a field strength here, and then I continue putting the remaining part of the path order exponential. Okay? Is it clear? All of this should probably be familiar in a way or another. You probably, you inter this is how this definition is just a more geometrical way, but it's absolutely equivalent to saying that f mu nu is just the commutator of two covariant derivatives. This tells you precisely that if you go like this, like this, or like this, like this, which is a small rectangle difference, that I get f mu nu. So I just find the picture on the top more geometric. Good? If you have any questions, it's the time to ask about this. Otherwise, I'll close the parentheses. This is. So is it a fair statement that you saw all this? Perhaps I'm just setting the notation, but none of this is a novelty in this, in this box, am I right? OK, so now let's continue. There you go, this parenthesis, kind of, this refreshing, I think, will be useful. Now, to point out that if a connection A is flat, it means that I can deform the loop and nothing will happen because the field strength is 0. So if a connection is flat, then and if I consider a closed Wilson loop, this will be the same if I start shrinking it. Right? I can shrink it and so on. I shrink it all the way. So this will be, end up being the same as a very, very small loop, which will be just equal to 1. So a Wilson loop of a flat connection around a closed loop is just 1. I just shrink it, 
the loop disappears, and I have path order exponential around the loop of length zero, so it's, ex it's, it's nothing. It is just one. OK? So this is one for uh, homotopically, trivially, homotopic, homotopically trivial curves. That is, curves that I can contract. If I can contract, I'm good. But it's not, it doesn't need to be trivial if I cannot. Okay? <clears throat> but then it's not trivial, but it's topological. Meaning that if it encircles, for example, a cylinder, I can move it around as I want. It doesn't change. All that matters is the winding. How many times it winds the circle? Once, twice, three times. Those are global properties that don't change. But locally, how I wrap with, my, with a rubber my cylinder will not matter. So now let's apply this to our example. Let's consider that our n of sigma and tau, we can think of it as a map from a world sheet, which is a cylinder. It's a cylinder because sigma here is identified, right? And time here goes like this, tau. Right? It's a map from sigma and tau into the target space. Right? So what I can do is I take my connection, which is a connection on the world sheet, on this d sigma d tau. Right? This is a connection on the two-dimensional world sheet. And I can take this connection and <clears throat> consider an integral that encircles this cylinder and construct this Wilson loop. And this quantity is equal to one that I put here. For example, upstairs and going at some straight, a much nicer contour. Which is also equal to one that I put here, and so on and so forth. So all of them are all the same. All that matters is that I put some connection and go around the cylinder once. How I go doesn't matter. Is it curly? Is it here? Is it here? Doesn't matter. So they are all the same. <clears throat> so this is just trace around some curve that circles the cylinder. <clears throat> Path order exponential of my integral of A. All these curve, all these give the same. Okay? And if you want more explicitly, these ones that are straight, they are just the path order exponential of the integral d sigma. Now the component sigma of the connection, which is actually very simple, it is just i sigma dot n over u from 0 to 2 pi at tau fixed. So, for example, those special ones. When I just fix tau, I just use the component a sigma d sigma. If I also move in tau, I also use a tau d tau. <clears throat> so when I do a curly one, I get the same as this very simple one, because I also use a tau d tau, and the connection is flat. We are imposing periodic boundary conditions, of course, crucial. Well, we want this topology to be non-trivial. So it's crucial that sigma is a periodic vector, right? And therefore sigma, the map sigma tau to target space is a map not from plane to target space, but from a cylinder to target space. But do we also have some, because it's just periodic in tau. Oh, tau, now we are forgetting about tau. Okay. If it's periodic in tau, it can be periodic in tau. I'm not specifying what happens in tau. Uh, here, yeah, the, periodic, the crucial periodicity is in sigma. But now, it's just a question of interpreting what we did, because what we did is very powerful. What we did is we found the following. We found that given a classical solution of the equations of motion, so you give me a solution to the equations of motion, n, 
And out of it, I construct a quantity that doesn't depend on where I put it. That is tau independent. But what's this? This is the definition of a charge. It's the definition of a conserved charge. It's a quantity that doesn't depend on time. So I construct a conserved charge But here the critical point is that because this is a charge that depends on u for any u, it's actually not one charge, it's infinitely many charge. Because I get a u dependent charge, so I can expand in u, for example, and each coefficient in u is a conserved charge. So what we are getting is charges with capital S, and we are getting infinitely many conserved charges. So this is extremely powerful. What are these conserved charges? These conserved charges are just trace of this matrix omega, which is the path order exponential around the curve gamma of A. Let me emphasize that A depends on the vector n and on the spectral parameter u. And because <coughs> this A is a traceless matrix, this matrix is an element of the group SU2. In other words, it has determinant equal to 1. In other words, if one eigenvalue is lambda, which I will write as e to the i p of u, the other eigenvalue is 1 over lambda, which I will call e to the minus i p of u. So this trace of this matrix omega in terms of the eigenvalues of this 2 by 2 matrix, it's just 2 times cosine of P of u. Okay? So now you give me a classical solution, and I find a cosine of a P of u, where P is a function that is associated to each classical solution of the equations of motion, and this defines a conserved charge. This function encodes the charges of my solution, and it, they don't change. It's time-independent. This is at some tau 1, this is at some tau 2, they are the same definition of a charge, which are all captured by this cosine of p. Good? Okay, but now we are basically done. Now the last claim is that this p of u is yesterday's P of U. That this P of U is this P of U. And this is the connection between the two. So now let's, let's see why this is true. There's not much to do to show this. In fact, all we have to show is, again, we just have to explain why this object has the same analytic properties as our P. We saw that Finding functions is the same as specifying their analytic properties. All we have to do is now explain why this new object P of U has the same analytic behavior as that object P of U. Okay? So let, let me give you an example. Where can P of U be singular? Well, let's look at the connection. We are just integrating some connection. Where can this connection be singular? Well, of course, at u equal to 0, it has a singularity. So p could be singular at u equal to 0. Right? So, for example, we see that p is singular at u equal to 0. We can also look at u equal infinity. What happens at u equal infinity? At u equal to infinity, where is the connection? There. At u equal infinity, you see the connection becomes very small. Right? Because the connection becomes very small, the path order exponential of the integral of a of sigma d sigma <coughs> um, Yeah, let me do the u equal to infinity at the end. It's simple, but I, I want to introduce some things before. 
<coughs> sorry. So it is singular at u equal to 0. Now, what about all these cuts and all this Riemann surface and so on? There's nothing fancy about it. You see that to find, we have to solve a quadratic equation. to get e to the i p uh, in terms of trace of omega of u. So if you give me trace of omega of u, which is a function well defined on the complex plane, no problem with this function, to get e to the i p, I need to solve a quadratic equation because cosine is e to the i p plus 1 over e to the i p, so it's a quadratic equation. So I solve this quadratic equation, and what happens when I solve a quadratic equation? I get two solutions, right? So these two solutions will be the two sheets. And there are the generation points when the matrix becomes not diagonalizable, where the two eigenvectors coincide, and those are the cuts. Those are just the points where the two eigenvalues become identical. When the matrix becomes a Jordan form, and there is a degeneration. Okay? Let's see it even more explicitly. So this is, the, this is how we would understand e to the i p. But we can also go and try to understand directly this p prime. So let's take the derivative of this definition. So we get 2 sine of p of u times p prime of u is equal to the derivative of this object. Let's define also this object as being t of u is equal to t prime of u. So that means that t prime of u is equal to t prime of u divided by sine of p of u, but sine of p of u is 1 minus cosine square, so in the end you get square root of 4 minus cosine square, but cosine is related to this, minus t of u square. <laughs> Good? So what is the conclusion from this? We conclude that our object P prime has 1 over square root singularities when t is equal to 2. So at the values where our t is equal to 2, which means basically that the two eigenvalues are equal to 1, which is a singular point when they two coincide. It's a particular case where the two eigenvalues are the same, the only possibility when they are 1. At that point, when t is equal to 2 or minus 2, when they are 1 or minus 1, this becomes singular and p has a 1 over square root behavior. But p prime having 1 over square root behavior was exactly the most important analytic property we had. It was the property that was leading to these algebraic curves with a finitely number of sheets and so on and so forth. And you can now also analyze, you can take u very large, and when u is very large, remember we were measuring the spin of the solution. Right? At infinity, we saw that it goes like p goes like 1 over u times the spin of the solution, l minus n over 2, something like that, or l minus 2n. And here, how does it come about? When u is very large, the connection becomes just sigma dot n. So you just integrate sigma dot n, which is, means measuring the spin of the solution. So you can work out that p prime, the asymptotics of p prime are related to the charges exactly as we saw before. So, so then you are basically done. As soon as you know that p prime defined like this is a meromorphic function, it has the right singularities, it has exactly the same analytic properties, there's not much to do. Now the rest of the discussion goes through along the same lines as what I said. When I want to find the two-sheet meromorphic differential with these properties, these properties, and so on, I would just, um, I would just uh, go along the same lines. There's only one subtlety. There's only one subtlety if I only have the classical limit, which is that if you just give me this p, and I want to say the only subtlety that I would have here is that I have these cuts, and I will claim that if I integrate p of u du, I get an integer, nj. Okay? Now, this is good. If you know that the underlying description, p of u, is equal to a sum of residues with unit coefficients. But the coefficient could be itself a function of uj. Why not? 
So we need to know a little bit more about the symplectic form on the, that when we are quantizing. We need to know a little bit. It's a bit uh, slightly the slightly non-trivial statement is to say that the integral of p are the action variables of the theory because these n's are precisely the action variables of the theory. Or said differently, but even that it's possible to do. I, I just want to point out that this part, this point. If when you try to reproduce it at home, you find that this point is slightly subtle, you are right, it is a bit subtle. I'm not claiming that it's 100% straightforward. Now, I could go on, we could analyze a little bit what happens and why this is the right normalization. A priori, you could say the following. You could say, I find these Riemann surfaces, all conditions are clear, and then I will parameterize them in terms of this integral, whatever they are, I call them NJs. I will not have the right to say they are integers and they are measuring the number of excitations in this cut, I will just define them to be nj. Then what I would claim is that I have a family of solutions which is exactly of this form, where I have some ni over l and ni. Then someone that knows the quantum version will say, oh, by the way, the ni's that you defined, they have a very nice meaning. They are the number of, of real quanta in each of your cuts. But I could have parameterized them in terms of some u squared times p of u, and that will define some n tildes, and I would have a different parameterization that would, not have, that would not be the natural one. So if you want to tell me what should be the right normalization to measure really the quanta, the quanta I have, you have kind of to tell me uh, a little bit about how you should integrate in you, what should be the appropriate measure, and that requires a little bit more work to clean up. Okay, I, I just want to point out there is some subtlety here, but uh, you should not be very worried about, provided the main message is, is clear. If you want, we could spend, perhaps, when we will be describing. I think what we will do is the following. So let me summarize a little bit and see what, and see what we achieved. And then let me tell you, make a few more comments about potential subtleties here. So the summary is as follows. <clears throat> and it's a good time to make a summary because next lecture, our starting point will be a bit different. So there will be no summary or anything. It's kind of a fresh start tomorrow. Then we will come back and merge things. but. Today is a very good day to summarize. So we start with some quantum, with some quantum theory. This is a big luxury. Typically, we are not able to fully quantize our favorite theories. But here we are. And we have a quantum theory. And then we go into the realm of macroscopic. And here we are describing humans. Right? Or classical geometries. As we said, the analogy in the first day, remember? This is kind of a classical picture where in the quantum picture there's only these cuts, there's only these points, and then some non-trivial geometry, these mansions emerge for P. It's really a mansion, right? You can go inside, go in these infinitely many sheets. All of these are artifacts in the classical limit. In the true quantum description, you just have a bunch of points. Da, da, da. And then all this emerges. It's really like emergence of space-time. So we start here with space-time. We don't know what is emergent and what is fundamental. On the other hand, we start here, and we go from this picture, we now know how to take solutions of my equations of motion and go to some classical algebraic curves. And this is a more typical situation, where you start with some classical theory that you control, and you want to quantize it. That's more typical. So typically what will happen is that you will start, this is, more, this is easier, you start with some classical theory, you have some classical integrability and this kind of method of flat connections that people also call lux pairs and so on. And by this method, you find this nice map that you can trade. Instead of going to a book of solving partial differential equations, you go to a book of algebraic geometry of labeling Riemann surfaces. Yeah, so now it depends on your taste. Some people like solving partial differential equations. Some people like labeling Riemann surfaces. Okay? But as I said, you should like this one because we solved this one. It's done. You just solved it once and we did it. So, but okay, we can trade it. Then the big advantage is that while solving classical equations of motion tell you very little about the nature of the quantum theory, if the theory is strongly coupled, okay, you solve some equations of motion, you can find one solution, two solutions, three solutions, okay, and then you can find solutions until you, you die of boredom, but basically you learn very little about the quantum theory. Whereas here, we are already very close to the quantum theory. This is a very ideal description to start uh, looking for a quantum theory. The idea being that these algebraic curves, if we had gotten here, we would immediately guess perhaps they come from some discretization. 
And then uh, I will try to find out what this imposes about some underlying mysterious equations that I don't know. And perhaps I would even then jump from there and say, where, how could they come up from a more quantum system? And indeed, one of the things we will try to do is, now we will find out in the next lectures, first, we will now go to higher dimensional gauge theories. And in particular, we will see that higher dimensional gauge theories, this is what we'll see tomorrow, they are related, at least morally speaking, they should be. We will draw lots of cartoons, given that we have been highly sophisticated in these lectures. I think we are allowed to have one lecture of mostly blah, blah. So we will have one lecture just with some random cartoons and so on, some hand-waving intuition to claim that uh, large uh, that gauge theories can be, thin, can be seen as spin chains or as string theories, that there should be some truth to this statement, that there should be some way of thinking about gauge theories in terms of either spin chains or string theories. And then we will go and describe these spin chains that appear from gauge theories and so on, and later we will go to string theory. And then in string theory, we will be exactly in this situation. We will have some strings moving in ADS5 times S5, which will be the relevant background for studying ADS-CFT. And we will see an application of these ideas, where we will start by writing, what are the equations of motion for strings moving in this curved space-time? And we write them down. Then they are a bloody mess, and uh, there's very little you can do. Then you convert those equations of motion, you map them to Riemann surfaces there. And then we will try to understand how we could quantize these Riemann surfaces and so on. And when doing so, I will address this issue of what's the proper measure for uh, how could we understand even this subtle point. And uh, when doing so, I think then you could later come back to this point in case you are really, really curious and want to clean up all the tiny details of this case here. Okay, so this is where we stand. As we said in the beginning, it's kind of an exploration between classicals, semi-classicals, and so on. And now we will see how this has deep implications, or implications at least in the context of more modern things that people are thinking about, namely ADS-CFT, holography, and string theory. So, good. See you tomorrow. Any question? So I'm saying that if you have a two by two matrix, this omega here, if you have a two by two matrix, I'm just saying a, a very simple statement, which is that the eigenvalues of a, of a two by two matrix define a two sheeted Riemann surface. And that's very simple because the quadratic, the, the characteristic equation that you use to find the eigenvalues is a quadratic equation. The, 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 I don't think there's anything deeper than this. It's just that you just solve determinant of matrix minus identity times lambda equal one. And this is the quadratic equation. And therefore, there are two solutions. And therefore, they, and they are connected. And uh, this defines the two-sheeted Riemann surface. So then I want to find two-sheeted Riemann surfaces that, uh, for this P. So this does not imply for P, it does not tell you that P here is minus P here. But it does tell you that P here and P after the cut differ by an integer. So you can associate this freedom of saying that the most general case, these P's will have an integer associated to each cut. And that's how these mod numbers will appear in this picture. Okay? <laughs>